This day was the seventh study period at the, uh, at the British Columbian Camp 1983. We'll come back now to a further consideration of the uh, information given to us in Revelation, the eighth chapter, where there is revealed to us the presence of Jesus Christ as he stands at his Father's right hand, receiving our prayers and uh, passing those prayers on in tremendous power to the God of heaven above. <clears throat> In conjunction with Revelation chapter 8, we'll take a look at um, Daniel chapter 10, where we have um, further information in regard to the mighty power of prayer, which has been given to God's people by the Lord himself. Daniel the 10th chapter, we'll read the first two verses, or the first three verses first of all. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came fresh nor wine into my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. In the 420th day of the first month, I was, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, he lifted up his eyes and had this vision of this wonderful person, which was in fact Jesus Christ. Now Daniel found that there were three solid weeks of waiting before the angel came through to answer his prayer. Now why was this delay? Let's uh, go a little further into the book, Daniel 10 and verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou hast set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days." Now this makes it very clear then that um, the delay in the answer to Daniel's prayer was not because of any lack of faith on his part, not because of any failure to work by correct principle, but because the angel had been detained to fight against the king of Persia, or to fight with the king of Persia, to bring about a desirable result from, the, uh, from that particular monarch. Some further facts in regard to this is, are given to us in the Bible Comedy volume, t uh, volume 4, page 1173. And um, these points, I think, are very, very important. 1173, Volume 4 in the Bible Commentary. We have before us in the Word of God instances of heavenly agencies working on the minds of kings and rulers, while at the same time satanic agencies will also work on their minds. No human eloquence and strongly set forth human opinions can change the working of satanic agencies. Satan seeks continually to, to block the way so that the truth should be bound about by human devising and those who have light and knowledge are in the, in the greatest danger unless they constantly consecrate themselves to God, humiliating self and, and realizing the peril of the times. So first of all, there's a picture here of divine or heavenly on the one side, on the other side, satanic agencies working simultaneously upon the hearts of rulers and kings. Now it goes on to say, heavenly beings are appointed to answer the prayers of those who are working unselfishly for the, for the interests of the cause of God. The very highest angels in the heavenly courts are appointed to work out the prayers which are sent to God for the advancement of the cause of God. Each angel has his particular post of duty, which he is not permitted to leave and for any other place. If he should leave, the powers of darkness would gain an advantage. Now it seems very clear that um, God doesn't have a backup to a given position. He has an angel who is appointed to occupy that position, another to occupy this position over here, and he has no reserves to back up that place which should be emptied by that particular angel. Because if the angel leaves his place of duty, the powers of darkness would gain an advantage. And for this reason, of course, 
we find that the angel was sent to Daniel whose name was Gabriel was not able to leave his post of duty in the kingdom of Persia until the desired result had been achieved in their working upon the mind of that king. <clears throat> now, let's come back now and um, develop this thought a little further. Heavenly beings are appointed to answer the prayers of those who are working unselfishly for the interest of the cause of God. And note the statement does not say, it does not say that heavenly beings are appointed to answer the pray prayers of those who are working for the interest of the cause of God, but working unselfishly for the interest of the cause of God. Now this requires a very, very careful defining of what it means to work unselfishly for the interest of the cause of God. Now, for instance, when a person, as you find such a person in the Seventh-day Adventist Church or even in the Protestant churches, turns away from a very lucrative and um, prosperous future. He may have a, a business that's going very, very well, bringing all kinds of uh, a strong cash flow, uh, developing and growing at a, at a fixed percentage or at a good percentage every year. He may have his financial future entirely assured but he develops a, a personal burden to work in God's cause so he sells the business and uh, gives the money to the church and then lives lives on a, on a, on a meager wage or perhaps goes coal portering and now turning aside from all worldly interests he devotes himself entirely and exclusively to the cause of God now would, would not the average person rate that as being unselfish service wouldn't they However, that doesn't quite agree with the, uh, the terms of reference we find in the Word of God. Let's go back again to Desire of Ages and uh, we'll learn from our great example what it means to really work unselfishly for the cause of God. We turn to Desire of Ages, page 208, page 208, to read in regard to, in, uh, in regard to the ministry of Christ. And let's see now what aspect in the ministry of Christ made his work to be an unselfish ministry. Now certainly there's no question about the fact of course that Jesus Christ turned away from a very prosperous business namely running the universe uh, from his position up in heaven he turned away from that to come down to this earth and denying himself all the riches of, of, of heaven he walked as a very humble virtually destitute person upon this earth and that was certainly unselfishness. It was unselfishness on his part to vacate the heavenly position to come to this earth. But it goes beyond that. That's just the beginning of unselfish ministry. I now read on page 208, the last half dozen lines, the last five lines, as a matter of fact, of the last main paragraph. And the statement says, So utterly was Christ emptied of self that he made no plans for himself. So what then is the evidence that Christ performed an unselfish ministry the fact that he made no, no plans for himself and that, that was after in other words that was after he had vacated his position and left his prosperous business up in heaven to come down to this earth and give his whole time in, in sacrificial service for mankind now, in other words if a person leaves a prosperous business and devotes himself to church work all his life for the cause of God which he truly loves but in his devotion to God's cause, he makes plans for the execution of that work, then is his truly an unselfish ministry? No. No, it's not. Because the mark, the final mark of Christ's unselfish ministry was the fact that he made no plans for himself. Let's read those words again. So utterly was Christ emptied of self that he made no plans for himself. <clears throat> he accepted God's plans for him and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So shall we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. Now remember the statements and messages to young people, does anyone know the page where it says that uh, there's no limit to the usefulness of one who put himself aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit. How many times in the past we have uh, thought about that statement and uh, we thought now I'll put self aside, I'll, I'll devote myself to God's work entirely, we did not understand the Sabbath rest principles and we wondered why there was, there was quite, a, quite a very a large limit to our usefulness. We couldn't even begin to think that our usefulness had become unlimited. 
We said so much we would like to do, but we felt so limited because of physical, mental and spiritual handicaps and shortcomings. And I know I used to say, well, I certainly have not realized the fulfillment of that promise yet. I think that I've, I'm working in selfishly for the cause of God. The fact is, of course, that until we come to that place where God alone is our plan maker and our burden bearer and our problem solver, and that, not until that time comes are we truly working unselfishly for the interests of the cause of God. Now, anybody then who lays aside all his own plan making, lets God alone be the plan maker and the problem solver and the burden bearer, anyone who learns to ask only those two questions, what are God's commands and what are his promises, and knowing these, they obey the one and trust the other, no matter how threatening the situation may be. When such a person attains that kind of experience, he can know that the heavenly beings, in fact the very highest angels in heaven, the very highest angels, are appointed to work out his prayers as they ascend to God for the advancement of his cause. So then, if our minds now um, consider this, uh, who was the very highest angel that came to, um, to Daniel? Gabriel, right? Now, people ask me the question, well, when Gabriel was tied up with the king, king of Persia, why couldn't some other angel come and attend to Daniel's prayer? Why keep the, man, the poor man waiting for three solid weeks without an answer, wondering what was happening during all that period of time? And the answer is, that was Gabriel's appointed work. Back in Daniel chapter... Uh, Nine, chapter 8 rather for instance the Lord said to Gabriel make this man to understand the vision so who was the appointed expositor of the visions to Daniel Gabriel was right now obviously of course that was not a full time job if you think of the lifespan of Daniel he was 18 years of age sister wife says when he came to Babylon 70 years later Babylon fell which made him 88 years of age when Babylon fell and um, then he reigned. For, uh, he lived rather for an unrevealed period of time in the land of Medo Persia. So I'd imagine Daniel must have lived to be a hundred years or more. In fact, he was. He walked so close to God. He lived uh, so healthfully that um, I'm certain he must have lived to be a very, very old man. He could have been running up toward 120, 30, or 40, 50 years of age before he died. And all that time he received a revelation which we find in Daniel chapter 8 one in Daniel chapter 9 one in 10 and one in 11 and you can sit down and you can read those four or five chapters in less than half an hour now it may have taken a little longer for um, the angel to have explained to Daniel uh, what those visions meant more than, he, he, more than he wrote down he probably wrote down a, a, a fairly shortened version of what was told to him the same as the life of Christ is much shorter in record than it was in actuality. So in a hundred years of time, Daniel had, shall we say, less than one day's actual revelation from Gabriel. So, there was, so therefore, Gabriel didn't have a full-time job, did he, exp uh, explaining visions to Daniel, not by any means. So in the meantime, God gave him other tasks to do. Namely, one was to uh, go and struggle with the king of Persia, and that, <clears throat> that tied him down for three weeks and that happened to be at the same time that Daniel was pleading for divine guidance and understanding in regard to the vision and so Daniel had to wait until Gabriel had done that task before he could come back and perform the other work of interpreting the vision to Daniel now of course Daniel had to pray at that point of time because the Lord needed the power of his prayer to influence the outcome of the struggle so then <clears throat> When you then send up your prayers to God, while at the same time living out the Sabbath rest principle, you can absolutely know that God the Father, in response to your personal prayers, sends not just a lesser, but the mightiest angels in heaven to carry out your prayers, even for the saving of your young people, as well as for the advancement of God's cause in all the world. Now let's come back now and see that picture in Revelation chapter 8. <clears throat> there are seven great trumpet soundings in the book of Revelation grouped first of all in a set of four then two and at last one and those trumpets are the outpourings of fearful judgments first of all upon pagan Rome then upon papal Rome and finally of course on the great Babylon 
of the last days, that mighty confederacy of, e confederacy of evil which, through, which will serve as Satan's agency in his final attempt to destroy the church of God and establish a kingdom of unrighteousness throughout the length and breadth of this world. Uh, fortunately, of course, he's going to fail because he has the key of David, has the authority to and the power to, to frustrate those, um, those moves. Now, let's think for a few moments of what must have been the position of God's people during the latter part of the days of the Roman Empire, pagan Rome, when the tremendous persecutions were leveled against the church and every appearance suggested that the awesome power of Rome was going to obliterate the church of God from off the face of the earth. <clears throat> and to make matters worse, of course, <clears throat> a large portion of the Christian church was drifting into the deepest apostasy. Do you suppose that the faithful of that time were praying earnestly for the deliverance of the church from utter destruction? Very obviously. They are praying that God in whatever way he saw fit would bring about the breaking of Roman power so the church could survive and go on to win his final victory. And as John saw prior to the outpouring of the judgment symbolized by the seven trumpets, as he saw the people of God upon this earth sending up their prayers to, them, to, to, to heaven above through the open door to the sanctuary, that Jesus Christ, the mighty angel and priest, standing at God's right hand, received those prayers, presented them before his Father in spotless righteousness, and then in turn God appointed the mightiest angels in heaven to come down to this earth to work out the prayers of those who were praying unselfishly for the cause of God. And while we can't explain quite how it works, the facts remain that the prayers of God's folk upon this earth do work a mighty influence in giving God greater power and greater access to the hearts and lives of men down upon this earth. <clears throat> this means, of course, that we need to learn how to pray. And I know I've um, covered this topic before in previous camp meetings. We've written a chapter on it in the book entitled Living Righteously. But in the meantime, there's, there's come a great deal more light in regard to the true science of prayer which I'd like to develop now in connection with the open door to the Philadelphian church as given to us in Revelation, the third chapter. This will lead us into the study of Jacob's trouble because that's a very important illustration of the true science of prayer. It will also help us to understand the, exactly, the exact nature of the struggle that we're going to pass through during the period of Jacob's trouble. And the better we understand it today, and the better we therefore prepare for it, the less agonizing it's going to be when it comes to us eventually. I turn now to page 253 in the book Education to a chapter entitled Faith and Prayer. And this is a, a chapter which sets forth the true science of prayer very, very well. Faith is trusting God, believing that He loves us and knows best what is for our good. Thus, instead of our own, it leads us to choose his way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom. In place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already his. Faith acknowledges his ownership and accepts his blessings. Truth, uprightness, purity have been pointed out as secrets of life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these principles. Every good impulse or aspiration is a gift of God, Faith receives from God the life that alone can produce true growth and efficiency. How to exercise faith should be made very plain. To every promise of God there are conditions. If we're willing to do His will, all His strength is ours. Whatever gift He promises, promises is in the promise itself. The seed is in the Word of God, Luke 8 verse 11. As surely as the oak is in the acorn, so surely is the gift of God in the promise, if we receive the promise, we have the gift. Now on page 257, developing this particular thought, we find this assurance first of all, through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied, every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. You are complete in Him. Now what do you want more than um, every deficiency of character supplied? Every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. Now, if you, have, if you have all that, what more do you want? Nothing more. 
and all that is, is available to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Prayer and faith are closely allied and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith there is a divine science. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. Sister White did not simply say in prayer there is a divine science. He said in the prayer of faith. Now, is there a difference between prayer as such and prayers of faith? Obviously, very, very obviously. In the, and the only kind of prayer that God is interested in is the prayer of faith. All other prayers are worthless and valueless. And in that kind of prayer, the only kind of prayer that works, there is a divine science. Not just a science, but a divine science. A divine science, of course, being one which has its, um, which has been formed in the mind of God, devised by the mind of God and given to us as a gift. It's, it's not a science worked out by human minds. Now, it is a science that everyone must understand, and the word must, of course, is the imperative. In other words, it's necessary, it's essential. You can't do that without, without of course, uh, failing in your life work. Now, what is your life work? Is it uh, building houses? Is it digging ditches? Is it flying aeroplanes? Is it being an accountant, a fisherman, a bus driver, or a train driver, or whatever? Is it? Not at all. That's your vocation in life, the means by which you earn your daily bread. But your work, your life work, and my life work is identical. It is the building of a character fit for the indwelling presence of God's Spirit, a character through which God can finish His work, a character that will be fit to dwell in the mansions of glory above, a character which is the perfect reproduction of God's own life and character. Now you may be a miserable failure as an accountant, you may never grow a successful crop as a farmer and still inherit the eternal kingdom, but if you fail in the life work of building a character fit for eternity, then what? The answer is obvious, isn't it? That's right, we fail in everything else, we fail to gain eternal life, we then suffer the lot of the eternally lost. Now then, <clears throat> in order to be a success in that work of character building, you must understand and practice the true science of prayer. You must. It's, it's, it's imperative. Therefore, to Philadelphians, this is a most important subject because they must be people who have faith and obedience, and faith and obedience can only be gained through the, true, the application of the true science of prayer. And it will be men of faith and prayer through whom the last message of warning shall go forth to a perishing world. So we now will spend some time on this subject, which is the topic entitled The Open Door, or in turn, The True Science of Prayer. And uh, we'll go back to a story in the life of Jesus Christ. It begins on page 196 in the book Desire of Ages. It's entitled, Except You See Signs and Wonders, and it's the story of a nobleman who came from Capernaum to Cana to request that Jesus Christ uh, heal his son who was at the point of death by a very, very serious illness. What's the title of the chapter? Except You See Signs and Wonders is the title of the chapter. What page was it? 196, the book Desire of Ages, chapter 20. Now I know I've been to the chapter in camp meetings before but um, I, I found that by going back to it again that there's, there's a great deal more depth and light in it than I've previously seen and I believe that you too will be blessed by a review of the contents of this great chapter in the book Desire of Ages. <clears throat> I start with the third paragraph in the chapter. <clears throat> the news of Christ's return to Cana soon spread throughout Galilee bringing hope to the suffering and distressed. In Capernaum, the tidings attracted the attention of a Jewish nobleman who was an officer in the king's service. A son of the officer was suffering from what seemed to be an incurable disease. Physicians had given him up to die. Now this, this lad was suffering from what seemed to be an incurable disease. It seemed to be incurable to whom? Men. Right? The doctors, lawyers, physicians, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees and so forth, they all regarded this as being an incurable disease. And we are to see, of course, in this a very clear parallel or less in regard to spiritual sickness. 
And how do men today around the world and the in the theological world and the everyday world, how do they regard sin in a person as an incurable disease? Isn't that right? Now, in this assembly, of course, we don't talk that way. We say, no, sin shall not have dominion over you. The Lord has promised to take away our sinfulness, to heal us of all our diseases, both uh, physical and spiritual and also mental. But go listen to the average um, preacher and in the average church around about and ask him the question, can you overcome sin and what will he tell you? Well, of course you can't. Everybody is a sinner, they'll say. And you have to put up with the fact that you're going to be a sinner right down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is not the universal confession or belief around the world today. And even the world with um, its, its correctional institutions recognize that when they release the criminal again, he's going to go back to continue his life of crime. Um, although some, of course, um, will restrain, refrain from doing so because of fear of going back to the same prison environment again, but just the same as sinfulness is still within. So just as that man back there was faced with the universal statement on the part of all around him that the son was incurable and was going to die anyway, so today men say that sin is an incurable disease and there's no way that men can be saved from its devastating effects. But just the same, when the father heard of Jesus, he determined to seek help from him. Now, I, I, I don't like the fact that the man only wanted to seek help from Christ. What he needed to seek from Christ, of course, was actual healing or restoration or deliverance, not just help in that direction. The child was very low, and it was feared might not live till his return, yet the nobleman felt that he must present the case in person. He hoped that a father's prayers might awaken the sympathy of the great physician. Now, do you think this man had a good hope that there was a, a reasonable possibility of his awakening in the assembly of the great physician? Mm -hmm. I don't. Might there implied uh, a little bit of doubt? Yes, but you don't awaken Christ simply, do you? No. It's always awake, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right, God's infinite love never sleeps, mm -hmm. and nothing that we can do ever changes God. God's unchangeable, and we never awaken his sympathy as we do with human beings. We go to a person and we awaken their sympathy by laying before them a, a good story or a, a convincing case, but not so with God. You do not awaken the sympathy of the great physician. So don't imagine for one moment that when you pray to God that you're changing him. Who is changed by your prayers? We are. we are, not him. We ourselves are changed. And being changed, of course, we are brought closer to the place where God can and will answer our prayers. So this man then had a very, very erroneous concept of the character of God. Of course, his concept was like that of the world around about him, and we can't blame him for being a victim of this wrong education. But we do need to recognize that in order to receive God's blessings, we have to have a reasonably accurate knowledge of his character. Well, you may say to me, that doesn't fit with the story of this movement, because we can think back, at least some of us can, to, well, in my case, close to 30 years now. And uh, when the message first came, there was no teaching then on the character of God. It wasn't until six or seven years ago that that message finally came through. However, if we take a second look at the situation back there, we realize that the very first thing that took place in our minds was a correction in regard to God's character. It came to us without our realizing it was a correction, but, but looking back now we can see it was. Now prior to the coming of that time when we learned about bondage to freedom, we then were victims of the common concept that, that God justified a person by declaring a sinful person to be just while he was still in a sinful state. Now, if God declares a sinful person to be, to be just or free from sin, while that person is still in, a, in, a, in, in an unjustified condition, then God, of course, is a false a bearer of false witness. He's a liar. He's a God of deception. Isn't that right? You see that point? And in the churches today, this, 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 um, for instance, you read bumper stickers on the backs of some cars, Christians are not perfect, they're just forgiven. Have you seen that one? Yes. Right. Now what they're saying is that a Christian is no different in himself from the worlding outside. There's been no inner transformation 
And if there's been an inner transformation, is that person actually just or justified in, in his condition? No. no, he's not. There's been no change. But modern theology says that God declares such a person to be just while he has experienced no change. Now what does that make God to be? A liar, doesn't it? Can you see that? All right, now one of the first things we learned in regard to this message was that, that God declares just those whom he has made just. That, that there's an inner work of transformation takes place so the person is no longer in himself what he was before and then God can declare to be just the person who has actually become just. So, so the very beginnings of our theology changed God from being a liar into a God of truth. So therefore, the study of God's, or the, or the knowledge of God's character was preliminary to our receiving the blessings that God desired to give us through the plan of salvation. And we'll learn in just a few moments that this man likewise, this nobleman, also had to have a different concept of the character of God before he could receive the blessings of God. Wrong concepts of God's character always produce rebellion, and rebellion, of course, is not the spirit of obedience, and therefore is not the blessing of God. Now, on reaching Cana, this man found a throng surrounding Jesus. With an anxious heart, he pressed through to the Saviour's presence. His faith faltered when he saw only a plainly dressed man, dusty and warm with travel. He doubted that this person could do what he'd come to ask of him, yet he secured an interview with Jesus, told his errand, and besought the Saviour to, to accompany him to his home. Now this man had a level of faith. Only a low level, but there was a level of faith. And um, we have to recognize that um, there are different levels of faith, and each level will, brings a corresponding reward. The higher the level, the greater the faith, the greater the reward will be gained through that larger faith. Now this man had never met Jesus Christ before, and uh, he knew about him only by the witness or the testimony of others, right? That's the only way this man knew about Jesus, which demonstrates the fact that we can develop a certain level of faith on the basis of another person's testimony, on another person's experience. But that level of faith gained by somebody else's experience, what will bring us to Jesus Christ, is not adequate to bring to us a living personal experience. Thus, I might, uh, for instance, talk to you about uh, the promises of God. I might tell you how those promises have worked in my experience or the experience of others. I might tell you what a relief I've had, what deliverance I've experienced and so forth, but that is not going to give you the same experience. It's going to encourage you to believe that you can have it. But, but not until you yourself go to the Word of God and find in that Word of God the revelation of God's power and laying hold upon that power, make your own experience in faith that you're going to see the blessing come. And that point is very, very powerful and clearly brought to view in the story of this man who came from Capernaum to Cana to ask Jesus Christ to bring healing to his son. Now, when this man saw Jesus Christ, he got a big surprise. Christ was not the kind of person he pictured he would be. I have a little fun sometimes asking people that... Uh, have been recommended, to whom I have been recommended and they've heard about me through fathers or mothers or children and um, and they picture in their minds, they, they, they build a picture in their minds of what they expect to meet when I come along. And I'll tell you one rather humorous story, I, th I think it's humorous anyway, but uh, in Sydney there was a, um, a young German couple, well young, they were in their, in their mid-twenties I guess and uh, maybe maybe chasing 30, and I had preached the message to her parents in Germany, a city called Krefeld. And the parents had um, been so happy with the message, they had written to their children and said, we, we better preach it, it really has the truth, we want you to hear him. And, and, and the young people said, well, we'll be glad to hear him when he comes back to Australia again. Now, I came to their home and um, we had a nice Bible study and I went away and they finally became very strong believers in the message. And later I said to them, now what did you expect to see when I turned up. Well, they said, there's only two kinds of preachers we've ever known. One was the big, uh, tall men that came in uh, and dominated us and ordered us to do this and do that, and the other was the short, fat, red-faced, bald-headed type. 
<laughs> we, we, we weren't quite sure which you'd be. <laughs> and in the end they said you were neither, you came in so quietly, you just gently laid out the message and you left us to the side, gave us complete freedom to do what we wanted to do and left us again. And we went and that we were encouraged to study for ourselves and uh, we proved the message true and so he came and stood, stood with you in the truth. Now this man, this devilman, had likewise built up a picture in his mind of what he would expect to see when Christ appeared before him. And what did he expect to see? Well, what had he been told? He hadn't been told how Christ dressed. He hadn't been told how Christ travelled. He hadn't been told about Christ's companions. What he had been told about is that which had impressed itself upon their minds. And what had they seen? They had seen the beauty of the character of God they have seen the power in Jesus Christ and the authority he had to rebuke demons and to heal the sick and the maimed and the blind and so forth. Now because in this world the possession of power breeds pride and the more power, the more pride, then when that man heard, about, heard that Jesus Christ was a powerful person, then what did he naturally expect to find? A proud person, didn't he? That's what he expected to find a well-dressed person, a very dignified, important person, <laughs> accompanied by a retinue of, of important-looking uh, servants or associates. And when he found Jesus Christ, he found nothing of that. He found a plainly dressed man, dusty and warm with travel, a very common person that, unless he was pointed out to you, he, he wouldn't pick him out in the crowd, excepting, of course, for the influence which surrounded him. And when that man saw this altogether different picture of Jesus Christ and still retaining the idea that power and pride go together, then the absence of pride was to him the absence of power. Okay? So when he, when he felt there was no power there, then what did he do? His faith faltered when he saw only this person without pride and therefore in his view without, without power. But just the same, he told his errand and besought Christ to come to his house. Now, when, when, when Jesus Christ now heard this man's request, he said, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you what you're asking for. I can't do it. In other words, Christ said, you're, you're approaching me in an altogether unscientific manner. He said, the exact words, of course, were, except you see signs and wonders you will not believe. On page 200, Sister White analyzes that man's prayer as follows. The nobleman wanted to see the fulfilment of his prayer before he should believe. Now let's illustrate this on the board today. We'll um, <clears throat> just draw a line across the board to indicate the, the passing of time. And this is the point of time when that man came to Jesus Christ with his request. That's where he came and asked. Now, did that man come asking for that which God desired to give to him? right he did so he came asking for the right thing did he ask the right person yes he did because Christ was the only possible individual who could supply him with his need but he, didn't, but he got a negative answer from Jesus Christ for what was lacking he came asking the right person for the right thing but he came asking in the wrong way now don't get the impression from this that um, that God has arbitrarily, arbitrarily said, now I'm the king of the universe, so I'm going to just spell out the way I want things done. If it isn't done my way, then those folk down there can go wanting. Is that the attitude that God has? No, it's not. The true science of is based upon the principles of law, which principles are, of course, the very foundation of God's throne, the very foundation of the universe. And, and therefore, it's not that God has arbitrarily spelled out these steps and procedures, it is because they are according to the principles of law, and therefore they can't be any other way. Okay? So the man came and he asked at this point of time here, and then having asked, he waited to see the fulfillment of his prayer, and when he should see it at this point here, then he supposed that he would believe. Of course, that's not faith. That's, that's walking by sight and not for one moment walking by faith. Now, of course, naturally then, he didn't reach out and lay hold upon the gift as he needed to do and consequently, of course, he didn't possess the gift as he desired to do and at that point there came no restoration for his dying child. 
Now, we may say, well, we're not in that category. We don't, we don't make that kind of mistake. We pray we really believe in the promises of God. But you know, I must confess that I have to continually guard against exhibitions of unbelief. Have you ever knelt down, for instance, and laid your petition before God? You give him a very serious problem and you just simply can't see your way through that problem. You just can't begin to imagine how God could solve it because everything is against you. People that have to uh, do things, for instance, they're saying, no, there's no way out. You've got, to do, you've got to produce this and this and this. If you don't meet these requirements, you can't have this that you're asking for. And the case looks absolutely hopeless. So go away and you say, Lord, you've got a problem now. And I give you the problem. And then you rise to your knees and say, now, I, I wonder, I just wonder, is God going to handle this thing? You know? And if you have a little sneaking doubt in your mind, a, a little trace of wait and see, then you're doing just what that man did, aren't you? Just the least little trace of it. You can know that you don't have that spirit of unbelief if you rise to your knees with a feeling of perfect submission and rest in your soul when you just know in your heart that God is the perfect problem solver and he's going to solve this problem for you uh, in his own good time and way. In the meantime, you have perfect rest and peace about the matter altogether. Then when you have that, you can know that you're not making the same mistake as this particular man. Now, when Christ said those words to that man, except you see signs and wonders, he was giving that man an analysis designed to reveal to him in a saving way, not in a condemnatory way, but in a saving way, why he could not have his prayers answered at that point of time. And Jesus Christ was conveying to that man through, through the outflow of his wonderful love, the encouragement to believe that while at the moment he was doing it in the wrong way, there was a right way to do it, and through that right way, God, through Jesus Christ, would give that man all that that man wanted. And that's, that, that is, of course, how it turned out to be. And in like manner, of course, in, in our presentations, we like to put our finger right on the failure point, not with the idea of discouraging you, not with the idea of condemning you, but with the idea of helping you to recognize, aha, so that was, that's the way I was doing it, and that way didn't work, that day was wrong. So then, all right, let's not weep over past mistakes, let's not feel condemned for past mistakes, let's, let's not feel that we're being shamed because of our past mistakes, because we've all made the same mistakes, haven't we? Let's regard those mistakes now as being a stepping stone to higher ground. Let's turn from those erroneous ways to the better way. Let's no longer pray the unscientific prayer, but pray the scientific prayer, because in the scientific prayer, of course, there is the guaranteed answer. In fact, on page 200, Sister White tells us, after she lists the various steps in the true science of prayer, when we have learned to do this, we shall know that our prayers are answered. God will do for us exceeding abundantly according to the riches of his glory and the working of his mighty power. When we have what? Learned to do this. Then will come these wonderful answers to our prayers. We shall know that our prayers are answered. God will do for us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask a thing according to the riches of his glory and the working of his mighty power. So we're going to take courage from the fact that um, this message is a revelation of um, escape from those old procedures of failure and the promise of entry into a life of successful communion with God wherein we can know that our prayers are answered and gain from him the rich blessings he has for us. Now we'll move on this afternoon at 3 o'clock to study the change in that man's approach and the glorious results which came to him as a result of that change. But for now our study period time is gone. These 45 minute periods are very short, aren't they? Are there any questions you'd like to ask in regard to this presentation this morning? Okay, let's take a closing hymn then. Let's try number 599. Now, I'm sure you know this one, surely. <laughs> Father, we come to thee 599. You better know the right question. No, no, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, we'll try something else. <laughs> Shall we bat it? <laughs>
Of course, it should, it should learn some new ones before the week is out. Two of us back here don't have it. Anybody else not? I don't know. That's a new one. Okay, let's try and learn it. Go up and down. Go up and down.